Welcome to this webinar, The First Breath and Beyond, care during the first 24 hours of a newborn puppy's life. Um, first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Shelly Hexum. I'm the content manager at Revival Animal Health, and I'm so honored here to have Dr. Marty Greer with us today. She is our Director of Veterinary Services at Revival and full of so much knowledge. We're going to talk today about the first day of life, the first breath and beyond. Are you skilled? This is a question uh, are you skilled at neonatal resuscitation? And this is a personal question. This is a litter of Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And if you're not counting quickly, there are 11 in a litter of Cavaliers. So this is this is something that requires a lot of work. And then my next question is, can you look at this litter of puppies or yours and say, are you able to identify risk factors for which puppies are at greatest risk for having struggles in their first few days of life? So we're going to go through those things. So these are the things we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about neocare research, timing the birth, causes of puppy loss, physiology of breathing, the four H's, neonatal resuscitation, high-risk puppies, breathing, formula, formula, um, breathing and colostrum, and puppy warmers. So we're going to have, this is your summary. This is your cheat sheet. This is your cliff notes of what do you need to do the first day, the first minutes that your puppy is, is born. And you're certainly welcome to take this to the veterinary clinic. If you're having a C-section, share it with your veterinary staff and they can help you with this as well. So we're gonna talk about your puppy's birthday, their birthday, like it's a party or their birth day, the day of birth. So these are two litters that are newborn puppies. The, um, cat, the um, one on the left is a Danish Swedish farm dog. The one on the right is a litter of Chesapeake's born at our practice. The one on the uh, left is my litter at home, which uh, my dogs generally are fortunate enough to free well. So first we're gonna talk about NeoCare. Who is NeoCare? What is NeoCare? And how did NeoCare put their data together that I'm gonna share with you today? So the numbers I'm gonna share with you later on, like seven times and 22 times and 81%, these are not Marty Greer's numbers. These are from NeoCare. NeoCare is at the veterinary school in Toulouse, France, in the south of France. And a little bit about them, they have 700 veterinary students on campus at any time, 280 employees on the campus, 24 PhD students, 12 residents. They've published 125 papers each year in peer reviewed journals. They represent 26 American and European board certified specialists, and just a, a really great wealth of information. And more specifically to our breeding, they spent 10 months in breeding kennels. They uh, have evaluated 726 puppies with 206 dams, 20 breeds represented. They took 4,801 measurements, not 4,800, 4,801, with 15,674 clinical parameters, 477 milk samples. Now, don't you wish you were the graduate student that got to milk a bunch of uh, bitches so that they would be able to do this assessment and 10 diagnostic tools. So we have a lot of really important data that we can share today. And so I've gleaned that as something that's a little bit more manageable for our information. So timing the birth could be an entire hour lecture. We're not gonna do that today. We're going to talk very briefly about progesterone testing that knowing the date of ovulation is absolutely critical, particularly if you have either a high-risk pregnancy, which of course you don't know until you're in the middle of a high-risk pregnancy. And of course, if you're scheduling C-sections, it's very important because that way your veterinary team can know the day to have a C-section. Today, we were doing two C-sections and we saw one high-risk bitch, one bitch that started to develop green vaginal discharge 15 days before she was due one bitch that went into preterm labor and one bitch that we're timing for a scheduled C-section. So in my real life, I practice every day. I'm in the clinic, in the practice. I do surgery, I do appointments. So this isn't just something that I'm sitting at my house kind of dreaming up ideas. This is real life. These are the phone calls that come into our practice. These are the clients that walk in the door. When I walked in this morning, there was a client standing in the lobby with a box, a heating pad and tears running down her face. So these are the high-risk pregnancies that we want to be able to help you manage by knowing when the female has ovulated, we can know when her C-section is due. So we also use progesterone at terms. Some people call it reverse progesterones, but that isn't always helpful. For the dog that went into labor early, that's important for us to know, but it's not entirely the number that we're gonna look at. I wanna know when she ovulated before I schedule a C-section. So really spend the time and the money working with your veterinary clinic to figure out the date of ovulation. Whelping of course is one piece of it, scheduled C-sections are another. 
scheduled C-sections can be 61 to 62 days post ovulation safely with the puppies being mature enough to be born. And then of course we have the emergency C-sections <clears throat> of which we had one today. So those are the things that we do in our real life. Pregnancy is 63 days long from ovulation, plus or minus 48 hours. So you may have them go a little early if it's a brachycephalic breed, if it's a Cavalier King, King Charles Spaniel, or if it's a female pregnant with a lot of puppies, typically they should go 63 days. If they have one or two before, they might go 65. After day 65, puppies need to come out. So it's really important that we know because we only have 48 hours, two days ahead of time to two days behind time to accurately get these puppies out where they will be able to survive. Too short a time, they don't have surfactant, they don't breathe. Too long a time, the placenta starts to break down and fall apart, which it's supposed to so that it's born with the puppy. But if we don't have good timing, we're not gonna hit the mark on the best outcome for our puppy survival. So we should never see a pregnancy shorter than 61 days from ovulation. Neonatal success, and I think the arrows on this that point out really should be pointing in because neonatal success is dependent on the bitch and her age, her nutrition, the quality of her pregnancy, the quality of her whelping, which is just, uh, parturition, the quality of her colostrum and the nutrition that we provide to the puppies. So very important that we have all these pieces working together. And where do we lose puppies? We can lose them anyway from conception all the way through the early pediatric period. After we get through the first two weeks, typically we don't lose puppies, but the stillborn puppies, the neonatal um, mortality from stillborns, the ones that don't survive well in the first 24 hours, those are really high numbers. So we wanna do our best to keep that from happening. So the most important thing that we're gonna talk about today is the transition of the puppy from total dependence to total independence. And so my questions to you are, shouldn't all your puppies be born alive? And in reality, if you've always had every single puppy born alive, you've been a very fortunate breeder because most of us somewhere along the way have really lost one puppy, maybe an entire litter. Why do we lose puppies? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but we'll talk about those. What do we take for granted? Because those of us who have been successful and never lose a puppy assume that that should happen. Why isn't this easy? Like, why is this so much work? What can go wrong? Oh, a multitude of things. If it can go wrong, it will. And what can we do to improve this? So those are the things we're gonna to cover today. There are reports of somewhere between 10% and 40% of losses from conception to weaning. So that's a pretty large number. There are catastrophic events where we lose an entire litter, sometimes a bitch. Uh, typically less than 10% would be ideal. And typically we will see somewhere around six to 11% of our puppies lost at C-section. Why is this important? Because you work really hard as breeders. You know those people who think you just have it really easy that you just rake in the money and go to the bank. You work really hard to get your puppies out alive. You work hard to have your breeding stock selected and screened for good health. You work hard at raising the dam and the sire. You work hard at selecting the sire if it's a dog that you don't own. You work really hard to get the timing of the breeding right, to manage the pregnancy correctly, to get the whelping to work correctly or their C-section, you work really hard at this. So it is not what you can take for granted. So what happens at birth? What is this transition? And how do we maximize the neonatal period, which we'll talk about today, the neonates in the next four weeks, which we will talk about in the subsequent 2024 webinars, which don't have dates set yet. We just have the November date set, so stay tuned. So how do we transition these puppies from um, dependence to independence, what does it mean? And what are the four H's? What is she talking about four H's? So the causes of loss can be maternal in origin. It can be dystocia, which is difficult labor, meaning she had a hard time pushing the puppy out quickly enough. And so the puppy lost its blood flow, didn't get enough oxygen, was a stillborn puppy. She may have had the puppies, but then she's not a good mom. She laid on them. She didn't lay down to take care of them. Something went wrong during that maternal period. Sometimes she doesn't have enough colostrum or enough milk, and it may be genetic. It may not be her fault. It may be that she had puppies prematurely. It may be we're not feeding her correctly. So there's a lot of things that we need to know about this. And like I said, every now and then we have preterm labor, which like I said, we had two today, one that was in on Sunday for her original evaluation, one that was in having an emergency C-section today, holding her box in my lobby in tears. So those are maternal causes. Next we have um, the fetal causes, which will include a variety of different things, including congenital abnormalities, so something that they're born with, 
genetic defects, which are not the same as congenital. Congenital mean you're born with it. Genetic is something that you have genetically that you inherited. You can have a genetic defect that doesn't show up until they're much older. You can have a congenital abnormality. That means they're born with it, but didn't inherit it. There can be infectious diseases. There can be parasites. So we can have parvo. We can have intestinal parasites. We can have injuries. Sometimes the puppy gets too close to a heat source. Sometimes the puppy's mother steps on it. We can have environmental exposure. Again, they got too cold, they got chilled. Something wasn't right about the environment. Sometimes they're not strong puppies and they fail to nurse. They may not nurse because they're not skilled at it. It may be that there's too many puppies and they get knocked around and pushed off the nipples. So a lot of things can go wrong. And then we can also have human error where, for instance, we didn't get the female in for her progesterone testing. We didn't get her in early enough for a C-section. We didn't identify that at the time she went into labor, she was in trouble. If you go to the veterinary clinic and they didn't use appropriate anesthesia or IV fluids at the C-section, that can con contribute to um, human causes of fetal loss. We can have staff that are inexperienced at neonatal resuscitation, or you might be inexperienced. So we're gonna talk about the day. And sometimes it's just bad luck. You've done everything right. You've worked really hard to do everything. You know, the neighbor's dog that got bred to the beagle and then she had her puppies under the porch in a snowstorm and they all survived. Yeah, sometimes it feels like no matter how hard you try, you're not the person that's as successful as the missed breeding. So we're gonna talk first about the importance of the first breath. And it's like I've said several times, it's the transition from total dependence where they're kept warm, they have oxygen through the bloodstream, they have nutrition through the bloodstream, they're in a nice environment, they're totally dependent on their mother to this total independence where they go from that to, whoop, they're out into the real world and in seconds, they have to go through this big transition. Now I'm gonna show you this short video. This is not of one of my dogs, this is a disclaimer, I found this on the internet. And I want you to look at the breathing pattern of this puppy. Um, I'm sure you've all seen puppies take their first breath, but if you watch this puppy, it starts, you can see it start to take a breath with its mouth and then its chest rises and falls. And then there's a long pause in between. So this is not a puppy that's strong. This is not a puppy that's got coordinated breathing. This isn't really what I'd like to see. But like I said, because I typically don't have this happen in my puppies, I want you to see this video. You can see in the background, it looks like the female is licking herself but you can see how this puppy's out of sync and how delayed these respirations are. At this point, there would be interventions I would be taking. I would not be taking video of this puppy laying on a towel. So that would be my preference is somebody was intervening. So what happens at birth? There's a change in the blood flow and a change in the lung function immediately as the puppy comes out. You have to clear the fluids out of the lungs because they are filled with fluid at the time that the puppy is born. There's surfactant that should be in the lungs to help the puppy's lungs inflate, the alveoli in the lungs. There needs to be a consistent respiratory effort. That puppy needs to be breathing frequently with the right coordination. The puppy needs to develop its own me methods of energy metabolism. It needs to start taking in energy and taking care of itself nutritionally. It needs to control its body temperature. So those are a lot of things that all have to happen, boom, and in one instant, exactly at the right time. So things go well for this puppy and it has a chance to survive. And I would challenge you to say that breathing is the single most critical and complex adaptation that ever happens in your life. You go from not having to circulate blood through your lungs to pick up oxygen. Of course, there's blood flow to the lungs for the, the necessary tissue support, but there's no lung oxygen exchange at the beginning. The fluid has to clear. You have to get the blood vessel that called the, the ductus arteriosus, which is the part of the vasculature in the chest that takes the heart circulating blood and pumps it only through the lungs for blood flow, but not for oxygen exchange. That has to change. All these things and instantly have to take place. And when I talked to Ken Sundin at Puppy Warmer, he said, you know, I never really thought about it that way before. So I want you to start thinking about what happens. So when a puppy is coming down the birth canal or it's being born at C-section, we have this puppy that's been in the fluids, underwater, like it didn't need to breathe. So don't breathe, don't breathe. Okay, your placenta is starting to separate. You're starting to move down the birth canal. You're moving out of the uterus. Don't breathe. No, no, not yet. Don't breathe. Not yet, not yet, wait for it, wait for it, not yet. Okay, now you've popped out, your head's out of the vagina, and maybe if you're coming with like 40% of the puppies with the rear end first and the head second, 
last, that puppy's already had the stimulation of the umbilical cord tearing, the blood flow um, changing, the oxygen level starting to drop, and this puppy's stimulated to breathe while it's still inside the birth canal. How does that get timed to be just exactly right? So what initiates that breath? Lots of changes that have to happen at the right time. Their oxygen level drops as their placenta separates. The carbon dioxide levels start to go up as the placenta separates. As the umbilical cord tears loose, it changes the blood pressure in the umbilical cord and from the placenta. So it stimulates the breathing. The ribs have to be flexible. The diaphragm has to move. You have to time this perfectly and we have to get the fluid cleared out of the lungs so that oxygen exchange can start to take place. So what happens? Like I said, don't breathe, don't breathe. Don't breathe yet. No, 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 not yet. Wait for it. Wait for it. Don't wait. Not yet. Not yet. Don't breathe. Okay, fine. Pop out and take your first breath. So I want you to not assume that this should just be taken for granted. It blows my mind every time a puppy is born vaginally, born by C-section, for me to see this miracle of the first breath happening. So I don't take this for granted and I don't want you to. If the puppy breathes too early, they inhale the fetal fluids and they don't end up being able to exchange lung uh, oxygen in the lungs because they're like, like they breathe in a swimming pool. If it's too late, they don't have blood flow to their brain, they've had brain damage. If they breathe in meconium, the first fetal stool, they probably are gonna end up with pneumonia. So if they were distressed during the birth process, then the um, fetal fluids have meconium in them, that yellow brown stuff. And if the puppy breathes that in, they can go home and get pneumonia. So. It's very important that we're paying attention to these things. So I want you to think about the lungs like a bunch of grapes. So the main stem bronchi and the trachea are the large stem that come down from the oral cavity from the mouth down into the chest. And then it divides into main stem bronchi and then into smaller bits, which are called bronchioles. And then it into alveoli, which are the little tiny air sacs, microscopic air sacs down inside the lungs where the actual oxygen exchange takes place, where the oxygen comes in from the breathing and it exchanges across the membrane and oxygen is picked up by the red blood cells and goes into the circulation. So it's a very complicated and very complex event. So remember your um, biology class or your zoology class where you learned about these things? So the airway has to be open for this to happen. So that the oral cavity has to open. The nostrils have to be clear. They have to have the fluid out of the lungs. So surfactant then has to be there so that that is the protein down in the alveoli of the lungs that allow those little al alveoli, those little air sacs to open up and allow the oxygen exchange to go from the uh, airway into the red blood cells and hit the circulation. And it's similar to blowing up a balloon, what happens with your first and second and third breath. The first time you blow up a balloon, it can be really hard because it hasn't blown up before. But each time the lungs inflate, it gets easier and easier and easier, just like blowing up a balloon multiple times. If you haven't tied a knot in it, you can blow it up, it, let the air out, blow it up again, blow it up again, and it gets easier every time. The diaphragm has to move, the ribs have to move, and the fluid has to get out of the chest. So think about that if you're, hesitant to understand this, then grab yourself a balloon that's not been blown up and do a little practicing. How does surfactant get into the lungs at the right time? Well, until the fetus is mature, they don't have surfactant in their lungs. That's why it's so important that we have that very narrow window of time, that 48 hours prior, day 61 or day 62, after ovulation, where it is okay because the surfactant has developed in the lungs. So the fetus has to be mature. It does uh, surfactant does develop a little bit earlier if there's stress to the fetus. So if the female hasn't been well, if there's 15 puppies in the uterus and they've been crowded, they're a little bit stressed so that raises their cortisol levels and they'll start to stress a little bit and develop surfactant a little bit earlier. And if we're scheduling C-sections and need to have that surfactant, solumedrol can make a big difference in the puppies. If you give that to the female, not to the puppies, the solumedrol is a steroid that allows the puppies to start developing surfactant just a wee bit earlier. So sometimes that extra 24 to 48 hours is the difference between survival and not having survival. So I want you to think about these things, the four H's. So there's hypoxia, which is oxygenation. There's hypothermia, which is the temperature of the heat. The third H is dehydration. So we're gonna sneak a little bit of an H in there. And then the fourth is hypoglycemia or food and glucose. So I want you to think about the four H's like a box. You can see this lovely revival animal health box that got crushed during shipment. This is not how we want your shipment to arrive, just to be clear. 
But if you see one side of the box collapse, you can see the other sides collapse as well. What does that have to do with hypoxia, hypothermia, dehydration, and hypoglycemia? It means if one of those four things starts to fail, everything else cascades and it fails too. So we have to have a nice, strong, intact four parameter box for our puppies to do well. So the four things are gonna be hypoxia, which always has to come first, breathing, hypothermia, hydration, and hypoglycemia. What is uh, What are the things that we can measure? And those are gonna be the APGAR score and oxygenation, the body temperature with the thermometer, hydration based on the appearance of the urine, urine color was how we assess that, and then weight and um, blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia. So we're gonna take these one at a time. So the first thing I want you to be able to do is identify your high-risk puppies using APGAR scores, birth weights, litter size, and 4Hs. And of course, breathing always comes first with appropriate interventions. So APGAR scores were developed in the 1950s when Virginia APGAR, who was the woman's first woman anesthesiologist in the uh, to be boarded in anesthesiology in the 1950s um, as a physician. So it's pretty exciting. She named the APGAR score after herself. So even after she's passed away, we are still talking about Virginia APGAR and her skill set. Obviously, they don't hang babies upside down anymore. We don't swing puppies anymore. So the APGAR store stands for five things. It stands for mucous membrane color or appearance. Second is pulse, the heart rate. Third is grimace. Now babies grimace, they make scrunchy little faces, puppies don't. So we use irritability reflex or the fact that they're actually reflexively responding to our touch. Fourth is the activity and the mobility and fifth is respiration. So a puppy can get anything from a zero on all of those, which means that it's going to have a zero score all the way down. If the color is bad, it's not got a heartbeat, it's not moving, uh, it doesn't breathe. Those are all zeros. That puppy's got a pretty tough go to try and survive, but with some support every now and then we can save one. But it's when we get up into the fours and the sevens that we really need to pay attention. If that puppy comes out screaming, pink, good heart rate, uh, moving like at C-section, like you have to chase it across the towel to keep it from um, disappearing off of the, the edge of the table. Those are the puppies that get, get tens. And my staff does APGAR scores on every puppy. And they will, as I hand them out of the uterus at C-section, if the puppy's, like I said, squalling, screaming, running, like it's a greyhound running out of the uterus and we have to catch the little creature, um, they'll say to me as they catch the puppy, it's a 10. So we know our APGAR scores are really important. So these were converted into something we can use on the veterinary side by Peggy Rick Cuthbert, who we owe a great debt of gratitude to. She is a theriogenologist on staff at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. So she converted this into something we could use on the human side. So very important that we understand that the APGAR score measures viability, the risk factors that we need to monitor, and the support that we need for our babies. We know from the NeoCare information that APGAR score puppies with less than a seven have a 22 fold increased risk of death in the first eight hours. And that if we have a four to a seven, but we give them good support, good interventions, that we can get up to 90% of these puppies to survive. So what are the hows, what's, when's and why's? How do we resuscitate? We want, of course, to do good suctioning and we'll talk about that. We wanna make sure that they get oxygen. So that's where your puppy warmer, oxygen concentrator can come in handy. Uh, your veterinary clinic, if your puppy is being born there may give epinephrine to the puppy if the heart rate is inadequate. Caffeine, I have a lot of people use that. And then of course, breathing, helping them breathe and veterinary care as indicated are all important. And we know puppies with an APGAR score of a zero to three need intensive neonatal resuscitation. How do we measure oxygen? Well, we don't have a good way to do that at home at this time. We're working with a company to see if we can develop an app, uh, uh, SPO2 reader for you to use at home. Right now, that's that little clip that they put on your index finger when you go to the emergency room or the doctor and they wanna check your oxygenation. The ones we have on the veterinary side work really well, but the $100 ones that you can buy on uh, eBay and Amazon for People, I have not yet found a $100 item that works on a puppy. So we're working on that. So what could we measure? We Just because we measure it doesn't mean we can manage it. It only helps you to manage it if you know what you're measuring. So we're gonna talk about all of these parameters. So the first thing is breathing. On the left-hand side, you can see a puppy that I'm delivering by vaginal birth. It's a little brown cocker spaniel. So it's on a blue towel, not a great choice, but I wasn't planning on using this picture when I took it. I just grabbed the picture. So I'm de delivering this puppy, clearing the membranes. The other puppy is uh, clearly, you can see the nostrils still in the vaginal 
canal of the female. So we need to get the membranes off. I just use a gauze or a towel. I don't use scissors because I'm always worried I'm going to hurt the puppy. Now, as they come through the birth canal, they get a good squeeze. If they're being born by C-section, they don't benefit from that squeeze. So we need to use our mucus trap, our bulb syringe, and then some other techniques. So this is a puppy coming out vaginally. I think you've probably all seen this. So really not going to spend much time on this, but you can see the puppies coming out head first, which happens 60%. Um, females turning around and moving, removing the membranes. If she's there to, and effective at it, great. If she's not, then you need to help her out. There are some techniques with the airway of the mucus trap. There's also an accordion, accordion technique where you want to put the puppy's head down and fold it so its chin touches, you know, back to toward where its belly is, not over the back, but down toward its tummy, um, where you can stretch the puppy out and then. Uh, flex it a few times and oftentimes that will help clear fluid. But the Dela mucus track is, trap is really my favorite tool. These run $10. They're not difficult to use. They're very affordable. We have them on our website. It's great tool. I would never whelp a litter without one of these. So if you're unsuccessful in raising your puppies, you really need to get a Dela. I would suggest you buy two, one for you and one for your vet clinic. Now at our clinic, our staff each has their own because we don't want to swap spit. You know, during COVID, we learned a little bit about that. So each of my staff members has their own with their name on it. They bling them out so that they've got all kinds of cool glitter and names and all kinds of stuff on them. But they're a very simple device. They come in a sterile package. But despite that, we, of course, reuse them because we're on the veterinary side. Now, this is a picture of Heather smiling because when her daily trap got half full, instead of continuing to use it, she stopped and she took the cap off and drained it so that she wasn't going to tip the daily too far and end up in with that in her mouth. This is a nice little video of John using a daily mucus trap. He's now Dr. Strupp. Um, he was uh, resuscitating this puppy. You can see that it went from, oh, there we go. There's our first cry. So that daily does a great job of clearing that mucus. And it's very easy to use. All you need to do is put one end in your mouth, the other end in the puppy's mouth, gently move it around and you will pick up fluid. And it's just like using McDonald's straw. It's you. You can tell when you're in the fluid Next to bulb syringe, we'll use that as well as the daily to clear the mucus. Uh, after they've got him breathing, we put him in an oxygen tank. And of course, Puppy Warmer has an oxygen concentrator. It's a great device. Uh, with that, it can take room air, which is 20% oxygen, and turn it into 95% oxygen. So as long as you have electricity, you can make oxygen for your puppies and not have to worry about your welding tank running out at 2 o'clock in the morning. If they're still not breathing, we use a 25 gauge needle in this location. It's called Acupuncture Point GV26. Some people uh, will put it in and peck with it. Some people turn it in, uh, put it in and turn it. Again, you just barely put it in uh, and then you can very easily use that as your stimulation point for puppies to start breathing. So make sure you have some of those small gauge needles on hand when you're doing your whelping. I use a 25 gauge if that's the only, if you only have a 22 gauge for your vaccinations, better to grab one than not to have it. Next, if our puppies still aren't breathing, if they're breathing, I stop. I don't do a needle. I don't do these other things. But if they're not breathing well, we use the five hour energy as a caffeine source. It's not the beverage, not the big can. It's just those little tiny bottles that you can buy at the checkout at the gas station or the truck stop. So all it takes is a drop or two on the tongue of a puppy. If it's not breathing adequately, the caffeine will stimulate it and that can be repeated. And next, if your vet has dispensed Dopram to you, Dopram is a respiratory stimulant. The concern is that it's a controversial topic. If you um, use Dopram on every puppy, you're gonna run into trouble. It is only meant for puppies that are really struggling that after 10 minutes of being born, they're still not breathing. After your airway is cleared, you can go ahead and give a dose of that if you have a prescription for it. It is a prescription item, but it should be used as your last resort. The reason for that is that it increases the metabolic requirements of oxygen in the brain. And if you're giving it at the same time, oxygen is not being delivered by breathing, then you can actually make the situation worse. So you don't want to use this until the puppy's 10 minutes old, that you've done all your other resuscitative techniques and it's not working. That is my last resort. Do I think I've got dogs in the world that would have passed away if I hadn't done it? Absolutely. Do I use it on every puppy? Absolutely not. So be careful with it. Now, if you've got them breathing, but there's still a lot of fluid coming out, you can tilt them head down. This is clearly a stuffed dog, but you want to tip them head down, not swing them, but clip, tip them head down so fluid continues to drain. This kind of makes the puppies mad, so they're more likely to breathe because they're a little bit ticked off at you. And like I've said a couple of times, don't swing puppies. 
we used to back in the day when I graduated from veterinary school, it was okay to swing a puppy, but what it does is it causes brain damage and bleeds in the brain. So please don't do that. If you're at the veterinary clinic, you can have your technicians learn how to do intubation. If you work with a vet tech or a veterinarian that's interested in learning this technique, I'm more than happy to help them. If you see this curled pink tongue, please continue to work on the puppy. Even if you don't have a stethoscope, this puppy has a chance. You see the curl of the tongue. If it's flat and gray, you're probably not gonna get that puppy to survive. If there's a curl to the edges and it's pink, keep going. These are the tools we use to intubate puppies. Like I said, I'm more than happy to work with your veterinary clinic to work through this and help them to learn to do this. I can do it long distance. And I will tell you vet tech will work for food. So if you have a vet tech that you're fond of and they're willing to work with you, take them pizza, take them chocolate chip cookies, teach them that if you work for us, I will feed you because what you don't know is a lot of vet techs miss lunch every day because they're so busy in the vet clinics right now. So take good care of your vet techs and your vet techs will take good care of you. Have a stethoscope. These are our $10 items so you can check for breathing and for heartbeats. Uh, and so what's the most important parameter you should measure at the first is the APGAR score. So please don't overlook that. It's easy to do. Now at our practice, all of our puppies born by C-section are born into a colored towel with an associated stopwatch. So my staff can time their time of birth and know if it's time to give the dopram, if it's necessary or not. And then they are marked with a specific color of nail polish, polish that allows them to go home with, the, with you as the breeder identified for where they were in the uterus and what their APGAR score was and what you need to do to help support them if they had a low APGAR score. So instead of going home and trying to figure out if it's the one with the uh, brown spot on its left ear or the right ear, you can very easily identify that puppy. We also have the uh, breeder's edge collars that can help you identify those. And this is what my surgery report looks like. And again, if you have a vet clinic or a vet tech that's interested in working with this, I can help them get this figured out. So this why is where uh, we've sort of geogra geographically given an identification for where the puppy was in the uterus. And then we know what birth the order was, what color the puppy's towel was, who the staff member was, and what time that puppy was born. Hypothermia comes next. So it's essential we keep our puppies warm during resuscitation. Uh, of course, you can take their temperature with a rectal thermometer. Puppies do have a big enough rectum, even if they're little tiny two ounce puppies, that with some lubrication on the uh, thermometer and you can get these quick read digital thermometers that you can very easily monitor their temperature. And again, we get back to this hypoxia, hypothermia. If they're cold, then their gut stops moving. That's called ileus. They start to foam up their food in their stomach. They start to aspirate that and then they become septic. Their glucose level drops, they dehydrate and everything goes wrong. So room temperature where the puppy is should only be about 75 degrees. You don't have to make it 90 degrees in the room, but the surface where the puppies are kept should be 90 to 95 in their first 24 hours with a rectal temperature 24 of 94 at the beginning in the first 24 hours. By the second day, they should be up to 96 degrees. And then the temperature goes up about one degree a week as they mature. A hypothermic puppy has a fourfold increased risk of death. So how do we keep them warm during our C-sections? Well, I use this fancy gift wrap tray that we put heating pads in. I put them in a tray because many times my clients are busy taking pictures and putting them on Facebook instead of paying attention to where their puppies are. So I wanna go through a few things here from Puppy Warmer from Ken Sundin. Uh, and he's got some words of wisdom here that we wanna create conditions that encourage neonatal, neonatal health, prevent mistakes that you can make that unnecessarily cause at-risk puppies, be in tune with the puppies to intervene quickly. If, if there's an early problem, you can intervene. Keep them warm and dry, feed them. Keep them warm and dry, feed them. Keep them warm and dry, feed them. So just keep doing those again and again. And we're gonna go into a lot more detail. So the puppy warmer system is two pieces of equipment. It's the oxygen concentrator, which makes 95% oxygen out of room air and the puppy warmer incubator. And together I've had clients call me and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Greer, like the puppies go into the incubator with oxygen and they zoom around like puppies on a racetrack. It's amazing how well they do. I also use the heated whelping nest, which we do carry at Revival as a nice source to keep puppies warm. If you look at your puppies, you get a pretty good idea of how they look. If they're curled up, if they're piled on top of each other, they may be cold. If they're stretched out and warm, especially if they're laying on their back, these are puppies that are warm and comfortable. But remember that puppies don't want to all be at the same temperature all the time. They like a thermal gradient, meaning that they can move around the warmer and cooler areas in the whelping box as it suits them. 
So Ken has deliberately designed the incubator to not always be exactly at the same temperature in every corner that they can adjust their temperature by a few degrees. Heat lamps are a big no-no in my world. We tried to set our barn on fire one year. I've had a client set their garage on fire. So I'm very concerned about fire. I'm very concerned about the female being overheated or the puppies being overheated and dehydrated. So if we give them a thermal gradient with a heat source from underneath, it's a much safer source. Third is hydration. If we have dehydrated puppies, you can't tell by the back of the neck, the skin. Um, that isn't going to work in a puppy because they don't have the body fat of an adult dog. So you need to look at the color of the urine. But this very fancy device called a cotton ball. So the color of the urine on a cotton ball should be very pale yellow. If it's a darker yellow, the puppy is dehydrated and needs to either nurse more or be supplementally fed. Now, I don't have a good place to put this in, so I threw it in here, but it's really important that we do our cord care on these puppies. And when I talk about this, we have a nice product on the market now called Clean Cut. It's a gelatinous kind of beta, beta dine so that the puppy um, has a nice dip of iodine around the cord. This is tincture of iodine, which is iodine and alcohol, which dries up the cord. And I don't want you to kind of mist it on. I want you to actually dip the cord in this. And this is a bottle that's meant to be a one use product. So don't reuse it. It's a little bit more than you probably need, but 30 ounces or 30 mils is about as small as we can make a device that really works. So dip the cord. It doesn't stain. It does a great job. Fourth is hypoglycemia, the blood glucose. Now I don't routinely check glucose levels on normal puppies that are gaining weight, thriving, have good color, are moving around. But if you have a puppy that's sick, you certainly can do a blood glucose level on them by sticking their foot pad. If you have a glucometer because you have a diabetic member of your family, you can use that with the same dipsticks that you use for people. But there is a device called a pet test that is meant for measuring glucose levels in our puppies. The glucose level in the blood should be at least 90 milligrams per deciliter. If they're hypoglycemic, they have a fourfold increased risk of death. Remember Neo, Neo Care. And then fourth is our food and fluids. So I do keep track of the weight, the temperature, the urine color, and then early neurological stimulation and APGAR scores on our puppies. You can use something simple like this. You can use an Excel spreadsheet if you're talented. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you can very easily see from this graph that puppy white and puppy yellow are not thriving as well as the rest of the litter. So those are the puppies that should deserve attention. What does that happen? Well, sometimes it's litter size. This is one of my litters of 10 Corgi puppies. Yes, all in one litter. Yes, not Photoshopped before the day that we had Photoshop. So we know large litter sizes put our puppies at a fourfold increased risk of death. Number one, because they have low birth weight. Number two, because if they're born vaginally, they may be slow delivery. So they're in the uterus or coming down the birth canal for a longer period of time. And number three, because of that, they have oxygen deprivation. We know our low, low birth weight puppies have an 81% greater chance of death and that small puppies have an increased risk as well. And puppies we used to say could lose 10% of their body weight and be okay. But from NeoCare's data, we know that if they lose more than 4% of their body weight after birth, that they have an eightfold increased risk of death. So <clears throat> I talk a lot about small for gestational age puppies, which means that these puppies are smaller than they typically would be. They're, they're not premature. They just are small. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It can be that the bitch was sick. It can be something went wrong with the pregnancy like herpes, but it can be that there's just too many puppies in the litter because the uterus only has so much real estate. And if there's 10 puppies in a uterus, it's really meant to hold six, they're crowded. Just like these trees that have a little tiny bit of dirt that are growing out on the mountains in the rock, they're tiny little scraggly puppies. So they're not always successful. So this is a friend of mine who has corgis. She came to our practice the same day. These pictures were taken the same day. Her one bitch had four puppies, her other bitch had eight puppies. Now the little black dots on the mat are the exact same size on both pictures. So you can see that the four puppies are much bigger than the eight little puppies, especially that one way off to the left. So these are puppies that are increased at risk. So it's really important that we have good maternal nutrition, that we make sure our puppies get colostrum, if not colostrum plasma, and that we do give nutritional support either with getting them on the nipple to nurse or that we are bottle or tube feeding. Please don't make up sponge feed. Please learn to tube feed. The question a lot of people have is, do I need to supplement feed my puppy? And a lot of people are reluctant because they think if they feed the puppy with a bottle or a tube, that then the puppy's going to be full and it's not going to crawl over a nurse. And I'll tell you, that's not the case. If you feed a puppy and then put it back with its mother, you're going to see it just motor right over and crawl back into the lineup and start to nurse on the bitch. 
And I think that's really interesting. And a lot of people just, they don't get it. They think they're going to hurt the puppy by feeding it. And it's really not true. Who at Thanksgiving has never had a piece of pie after they were really full? Of course, you eat your turkey, your stuffing, your you know cornbread, your potatoes and gravy, and then you have a piece of pie. Like you weren't really hungry, but you ate it anyway. Um, we know our puppies should gain two to four grams per day per kilogram of anticipated adult body weight. So that's a great formula, no matter what breed of puppy you have, to calculate how much they should be gaining every day. And a puppy should double its birth weight by the time it is seven to 10 days old. Low birth weight puppies certainly have risk. And we know that toy breeds are 100 to 200 grams or a quarter of a pound, four ounces when they're born. Large breeds are around a pound and giant breeds are over a pound. Very helpful. So tube feeding makes a lot of people nervous. There are five tips that I'm gonna give you today that help you decrease the risk of a tube feeding accident. Now, if you feed enough puppies often enough, at some point you may have an accident because the puppy aspirated, the puppy, something went wrong with it. So I want you to keep in mind that not every puppy that you tube feed, you can still have accidents that happen. But if you do these five steps, you're gonna decrease the risk. And I will encourage you to tube feed because you will lose more puppies to starvation than by a tube feeding accident. I every day talk to people that have just not been willing or uh, uh, really aware that they need to feed the puppy. So the five steps are pre-measure the tube so that from the tip of the nose to the last rib, that's where you put the mark on the tube. The tube should go all the way into the last rib. The second is to pre-warm the puppy so that the formula is warm and the puppy is warm at least 96 degrees on the puppy. I don't measure my thermometer, a thermometer on my milk. I use my wrist, I'm old school. Um, three is you pass with the chin down with the tube to the left side. And the most important thing is that you pinch the toes or the tail before you feed. If the puppy can cry, you're not in the trachea. You're not in the airway. If the puppy can't try, can't cry, then pull out the tube, stop, go get a cup of coffee, come back and try it again. The amount to feed is one cc per one ounce of body weight. So a four ounce puppy gets four cc's, an eight ounce puppy gets eight cc's, a 16 ounce puppy gets 16 cc's every three to four hours. At two o'clock in the morning, when you're up by yourself, I don't want complicated math of how many kilocalories and how much is this and that and the other thing. This is what the stomach capacity of the puppy can accommodate. So this video, I'm gonna show you, this is uh, me measuring the length of the tube for this puppy to have put in. So we're gonna lay him on his side um, and then measure the tube. So this is a little Rottweiler puppy that came to the practice. His brother was thriving, he was not. This video, this actual exact video clip is on the Revival Animal Health Learning Center. So if at two in the morning you need help, I'm there, not literally to hold your hand, but at least on the video. And I very frequently have people say that this was the difference for them of survival and not survival because they felt comfortable tube feeding. So this is the same puppy. Um, the client is clearly wearing the Rottweiler shirt. Um, so she was then really very comfortable in tube feeding and was able to feed the formula to the puppy. Uh, so she was holding the tube. You can see the puppy champing. That's normal. You can hear him vocalizing. That's exactly what I want to hear. He's not upset and crying, but you can hear him vocalizing. So, you know, you're in the esophagus, not in the airway. He's a little wiggly. That's okay. So that's my client feeding the puppy. And she was really very comfortable with it. This is a client that came from Iowa and she was so excited because she was learning to tube feed and she learned to do it before I would let her leave, go back to Iowa. Now the two Rottweiler puppy or the Rottweiler puppy I showed you before, this is him and this is his brother. You can't really tell which one is which. They're both pretty good sized puppies. But what I want you to remember is a lot of people are like, no, I don't think I should tube feed the puppy. I think it's just a run. I think there's something wrong with it. I'm just gonna let it go. Nature has its way of taking care of things. And I'm gonna say, don't throw your runt puppy away. That puppy has, a, you know, there, there's a reasonable chance that with some support nutritionally, this puppy will be fine. This is the Rottweiler puppy I showed you in the previous slide. 
At nine months of age, he took best puppy in show at the Fond du Lac dog show. That's where I practice, where I live. Don't give up on these little guys. So the only supplies you need are gonna be puppy formula, a feeding tube and a syringe, a marker, a rectal thermometer, and a scale. All very simple things other than the feeding tube you can pretty much run out and get any of these things, but make sure that you order your feeding tube before you have your litter of puppies, because if you get into trouble, there is no guarantee of overnight delivery anymore. Amazon's kind of bailed on that. Walmart's not open 24 hours a day. You're on your own folks. So get this supply list ahead of time so that you are ready to go if you need to supplement a puppy. In my world, there are lots of reasons puppies can die. And unfortunately there are some that do, but no one should starve to death. So just keep in mind that with support, these puppies have a really good chance of survival. Please don't let them just wither away. After you're done feeding, if the bitch isn't adequately stimulating them to urinate and have a stool, make sure you do that with your cotton ball. That picture of the stool on the right-hand side is normal. It should be yellowish green, a CD appearance to it. That's absolutely normal looking stool. So this is how we want our box from Revival to look is all four or all six sides, nice and tidy nice and firm, no low oxygen, no chilled puppies, no dehydrated puppies, and no hungry puppies. So together, all four of those hold each other apart. And as soon as one side goes, the, the sides on the other side collapse and we can end up in trouble. So you need all four of those. So please make sure that your puppies have adequate thermal support, that you keep them clean and dry, that they get adequate nurse, nursing time, and adequate nourishment. It's really important that we do that. Um, we do have the two books, both available on Revival Animal Health website. The first is the Canine Reproduction and Neonatology book, which goes through everything from pre-breeding screening for health screenings through the breeding, the timing, the pregnancy, the whelping, the C-section, the neonatal care, the stud dog fertility. It's a very comprehensive guide, and it's written not just for our veterinarians and our vet techs, but for my breeders as well. So be sure that you have access to this book. And if your vet doesn't have one, it's going to be Christmas pretty soon. Buy your veterinary clinic a nice Christmas present, take them a daily mucus trap and a book, and you will be surprised at how well this works for you. I was just at my local dog show or my national dog show, and I had a veterinarian that came up to me, a very young new graduate, and she said, Dr. Gray, I just want to let you know that your book is why I took the job I took. And I'm like, what? And she said, yeah, I was interviewing at a couple different vet clinics and I was at this one and I saw your book on the shelf. I pulled it off because she recognized it from the back, the spiral on it. She pulled it off the shelf and she looked at the vet that was interviewing her and said, how do you know about this book? And they said, oh, that's the best one to have. So she took the job. I hope she's happy there. Um, the other book is Your Pandemic Puppy, which I make all of my people buy before they buy a puppy from me so that they know what they're getting into. It goes through housebreaking and crate training and leash walking. Uh, preventing separation anxiety, but it also goes through the new protocols for vaccinations, the new flea and tick and heartworm medications, the ages to spay and neuter. So there's a lot of really current information in both of these books, really helpful for you and your puppy buyers. So before you have your litter, you want to make sure that you have your supplies and your equipment all lined up. I keep mine all in one nice um, ice chest so that I don't have to run around the house and find all these things when I'm ready to go. Now, clearly some of these things you don't need to buy from us. You're buying your own ice cream and your own bratwurst. And, you know, we're not going to sell you a vinyl back tablecloth to keep your floors clean. But a lot of these supplies we have for you. And we also have these as our drug and medical equipment supplies for things that you'll want to have on hand. So make sure you've got all your supplies together other than plasma we pretty much carry everything on this list. So we're a pretty comprehensive place to get all your supplies. So I wanna thank you all today. We actually do have a couple minutes uh, left over. So Shelly's back, Tom's gonna to help us with some questions. Yes, um, okay, we'll start with some of the, the questions here in the Q&A and chat. Um, somebody's wondering, you, you talked about the Dealey mucus trap as um, an alternate to the bulb syringe. Why is the bulb syringe not good enough and why, why do you, uh, you know, prefer the Dealey mucus trap? Sure, and that's a great question. And despite the name Dealey mucus trap, I think the Dealey mucus trap does a better job on the thin watery fluid and the bulb syringe does a better job on the thick mucusy fluid that puppies will have in their airway. And it often takes both. I alternate back and forth. If I hear gurgling, I'll use the bulb syringe, I'll use the Dealey and I go back and forth. So um, you can get deeper into the airway with the Dealey mucus trap than you can the bulb syringe and you get a different character of fluid out. So I would not pick one over the other. I would have both. Together, they're 
if your puppy isn't worth saving $15, $15, it's not that much. I would definitely have both of those on hand. We've got somebody else wondering about tube feeding. Um, how do you know what size tube feeding tube to use? Great question. I use an eight French for the bigger puppies. So puppies over probably 10 ounces. And I use a five French for my smaller puppies. Um, somebody's again, kind of about tube feeding, but they're wondering if the puppy is suckling. Okay. Why not use a bottle or, you know, a Playtex or Nook or something like that, um, sure. versus tube feeding. And that's a, that's another really good point is that if the puppy is strong enough to suckle well and effectively takes a bottle and you can measure that they're sucking down enough formula, I think that's great. I really like the Medi nursers, which are a 15 CC bottle. And I also like the miracle nipple with the syringe on it. So those are really good ways to assess what the puppy's taking. If you get an eight ounce bottle, it can be really hard on a small breed puppy to tell if they're getting enough to eat. But if they're happy to take a bottle, great. It's just, we'll have some puppies that refuse a nipple. They don't, they're either not well enough or they just don't like the taste of the formula and they just, they just won't take the bottle. So sometimes that tube feeding is the difference between losing a puppy and not. Somebody's wondering, uh, you mentioned sponge feeding and that you're hesitant of that. What are, you, oh. what are your, what are your specific hesitations with sponge feeding? Oh my gosh. The day that that video came out, the veterinarians that do reproduction, the theriogenologist list blew up. I can name a number of different reasons not to do it. Number one, you're going to not be able to measure the amount of formula. Number two, you can't have anything that's even close to sterile. Um, you know, clearly the bottles aren't completely sterile, but there's bacteria that are going to going to grow in that sponge. They're going to get fibers off or maybe even pieces off. There's petroleum in that. They're going to suck in a bunch of air. Um, the original video also had a neck band around the puppy. So the puppy wasn't able to do its normal little kneading behavior with its front feet as it was nursing. There are so many things wrong with that. The theriogenologist, literally the list exploded. So please, please do not use a bottle or use a tube, tube feeding, but do not sponge feed. Please, please, please. Okay. Um, somebody was asking on that Roddy puppy, do you happen to know what size feeding tube was used in that specific situation? That was an eight. Okay. Um, and then uh, somebody's wondering, Lisa's wondering, what do you recommend using for sub-Q fluids? I like normal saline, not lactated ringers. Normal saline is going to be better for the puppy at a very early age because they cannot metabolize lactate. How do you prepare plasma? And when you do, do you need to use, how do you use it and everything like that? Yeah. In our sick puppy video, the, the material we're going to go over in either January or February, we'll have a great deal of detail on that, but you want to warm it slowly in water that you have a thermometer in the thermal bath so that you don't end up overheating the plasma. If you overheat it, like microwaving it or putting it in too hot a water, you're going to denature the proteins and basically just give them a very expensive injection. Um, you need to give it with a needle and syringe. You can give it subcutaneously at any age, or you can give it with a feeding tube in the first 12 hours. So we'll go into a lot of detail. So stay tuned for that one. Okay. Um, Linda's wondering, can I make my own milk replacer at home? Will it be good enough? No, you can do it if you need to in the middle of the night to get you through until you can get your Esbalac or your foster care, one of the products that are made to be puppy formulas. But the protein and fat content and the amino acids are not sufficient. I see a lot of problems with puppies with nutritional cataracts if they were fed a homemade formula. We see a lot of diarrhea, poor weight gain. Um, don't, don't play that game. Please order the real thing that these companies have spent millions of dollars researching to get the right formula. Um, Anna's wondering, what speed do you tube feed? A lot of tube feeding questions. <laughs> Slowly, but about 30 seconds is the length of time I would spend. 30 seconds, maybe 60 if it's a really big puppy. Okay. Uh, Megan's wondering, do you recommend using maternal vaginal flora orally to help establish a healthy gut microbiome? You know, I've never tried that. I know there's some discussion about it, but I typically use a probiotic because I know that what's in that, I'm not sure what's in the vaginal fluids. It may not always be the best. <laughs> um, somebody's wondering, is it true that the umbilical cord heals slower when cut with surgical scissors as opposed to mom chewing it? No, it's the, it's really dipping the cord in tincture of iodine. That's going to change that. And the faster it dries up and falls off, the less likely they are to get an infection up into the belly. I lost one of my own puppies to that when I was dipping in chlorhexidine, which was the current recommendation. So no, I use tincture of iodine. Okay. Um, 
Jenna's wondering, when do you recommend giving colostrum and how much do you give? Immediately. And the only colostrum that's real colostrum, dog colostrum is out of the bitch. The one that's the mother or a sub, you know, another bitch that's had puppies in the last 24 hours. The colostrum that comes in tubes, in formulas, those other things that are advertised as colostrum is from a cow. And it does have some health benefits, but it's not going to give the puppy the immunity that they need. So it has to be mama's colostrum or a dog colostrum. Okay, we have a couple more minutes here for for questions. Um, What is your preferred probiotic for neonates, especially those who didn't get colostrum? So we have a new product from Revival called Nurture Care. It comes in a tube with that little dial on it. So you, it's very sticky, very thick. I've used it and it goes directly on the puppy's tongue and you can do that. It's meant specifically for newborn puppies. So it's really the best product on the market. It's got the most colony forming units. It's the most appropriate balance. So it's Nurture Flora. Yes, Nurture Flora there. Um, and then somebody's kind of wondering, because Nurture Mate, which we also carry, which is the colostrum supplement, um, kind of goes hand in hand with Nurture Flora. So somebody's wondering at what points should Nurture Mate be used as well? Yeah, Nurture Flora, I think should be used on everybody. Nurture Mate is sometimes used when puppies are a little bit weak and you just want to give them a bit of a boost. Okay. Um, Tammy's uh, wondering, she's looking at feeding tubes right now, and she says there's a lubricant listed kind of on the recommended uh, products to go with that. So do you recommend lubing the tube first? Well, it's a good idea to lubricate it, but to be really honest with you, I'm kind of lazy at two o'clock in the morning. So I typically dip the tube in formula in a bowl and then slide it down. If you want to use the lube, it's never going to hurt anything, but eh, you know, one more thing is one more thing. Um, okay. One more question. Um, Somebody is wondering, is it true that you should give your female oral cal right after her first puppy is being born? That's the calcium supplement there. Right. I like to start it when the bitch goes into labor. I give it even prior to the puppy being born, but not until she's actively in labor. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Greer. If you do have a question that we didn't get to today, uh, we encourage you to give us a call, give our pet care pros a call. Um, You can call them. They actually work with Dr. Greer. They're trained by Dr. Greer. So a lot of what Dr. Greer says, they repeat back and will will tell you over the phone. So if we didn't get your question answered, um, please reach out to them uh, for their resources. Thank you again, Dr. Greer, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our pet care pros at this number and don't miss our other pet health videos.